Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, San Francisco's premier author interview program. Today we're going to be into crime, but in a very different and a very original way. The title of the book today is The Crime Writer. It's written by Greg Hurwitz, and it's published by Viking. Thanks for coming by, Greg. Thank you for having me. One of uh, the writers that we've had on this uh, program more than once, a guy by the name of Robert Crace, has something to say about your book that I find startling. He says, the crime writer is the must-read crime novel of the year. That paid him for that right away. Yeah, I paid him a lot. Okay. Brilliantly rendered with a hip intelligence and fierce originality. This book is a stunner. Greg Hurwitz may well have created a brand name franchise and deservedly so. Now, I don't want to go into the brand name franchise because that's the future. I want to talk about the present. What in the name of heck is fierce originality? I think it's probably... Have you ever been accused of that before? Fierceness, yes. Okay. <laughs> originality separate, but put together, it is slightly baffling. <laughs> I, mean, I think it's probably from the notion of taking a crime writer and making him the protagonist of the show. Okay. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the idea that came to me. But uh, that the, the main character, Drew Danner. Yeah, the main character basically runs the show. He's the protagonist of the book. And it's basically about, I mean, in the course of my career with my early books, I did a lot of odd and stupid things in the name of research. I've gone undercover in a mind control cults. I've snuck onto demolition ranges with Navy SEALs and blown up cars. And so one of the things that I got to thinking is, you know, as crime writers, we know a little bit about a broad range of different kinds of trouble. Mm -hmm. But as we, you know, everybody knows that a little knowledge can be a very dangerous thing. (laughs) So my notion is to say, what if you get this guy who's got a unique slant on crime that's as often faulty as it is helpful. And he wakes up essentially in a plot that seems torn out of one of his own pot boilers. And he has to use his skills as a crime writer to untangle himself. And so then what happens after that is that his, uh, he experiences crime and its pain and its, you know, after effects in a, in a very personal way. He, he's no longer, if you will, abstract. Absolutely. And he realizes that a lot of his notions, some of his starting notions are helpful he knows criminalists he can call. He knows how police interrogations work. But he also realizes that a lot of the notions that he had about crime are completely wrong. A lot of them are imported from books and TV, like with all of us. Aha. Uh-huh. So he's running into these situations where people are saying, look, Drew, I'm sure you want a DNA analysis run in 24 hours, but it don't. this is the real world. It don't work like this out here. <laughs> you know, so back to square one. And also, he's not acquainted with... He realizes the exploitive nature of his job as a crime writer in a certain way. And the fact that when he himself was at the center of a high profile murder case and could very well be the murderer, he has yes. amnesia and isn't aware. Yeah, of he, it, one of the questions that is here at the start of the book is, did I kill or not? Right. And he doesn't know. He really doesn't he know. He doesn't know. He's woken up in a hospital room with a scar on his head and a, you know, a cop flapping a picture a crime scene photo of his dead fiance in front of him. And they think he did it. He's got her blood under his nails and he cannot remember that night to save his life. Mm. And so, you know, his, his understanding of the real pain that comes from being at the center of an investigation. And he reflects back on the ways that he used crime to sell books and to do research and all these other things. And it, it doesn't have, he's never been inside the belly of the beast the way that he is now. Yeah. Now, you know, instead of being the writer in charge, Danner is at the very center of all that happens for good or ill. Absolutely. <laughs> Giving everything, you know, a quite different perspective, both yeah. for him and for, uh, for readers. This is interesting. From, from the reader's standpoint, I, th- I think you have the same kind of experience. This, this damn thing is upside down. Well, it's completely upside down. And in fact, when he gets some ways into his investigation, I mean, he finds himself... You know, he's at the center of these bizarre psychological assaults that seem like they're almost springing from his own imagination. Right. And right. he doesn't know. It's, is he being gaslighted? Is he gaslighting himself? And when he gets into this a certain way, he realizes that to make any sense of what happened to him, what's still happening to him, he has to sit down and write this story the way that he's written the stories before. And so on page you know, 90, he sits down and writes the first paragraph that opened the novel. And, you know, so so the book that we're reading, his process of writing the book and the investigation are married into one, and that's the book that we're reading, is the book that he's writing. And the manuscript at some point has editorial notes, and they're <laughs> put there by one of the characters, Preston Mills, 
who says to him, look, fella, the way out of this quandary that you're in is to investigate, to go at it as though it's part of the story. He says it's like building a plot, but you're stuck in the middle of it. And so basically, you know, Drew has written this written this manuscript and Preston's come in and looked at it and said, well, if this was a plot, what I would say to you as your editor is you're not looking at you're looking at A and B, but not at X and Y. Uh, And so he gives him editorial notes that then impact Drew's investigation. Yeah. And things then start. It's like it's building a plot, but the stakes are incredibly high. The crime writer is full of fascinating characters like this fellow Preston Mills, the editor at large from New York, hanging out in the West Coast. And we'll meet more of them when we come back. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. This is Conversations on the Coast. The title today is The Crime Writer. It's a novel uh, written by Greg Hurwitz, published by uh, by Viking. And uh, it's had a lot of advanced praise from interesting people. Dennis Lehane says, with The Crime Writer, Greg Hurwitz has taken a quantum leap forward in the realm of American suspense literature, a thrilling mind-bending journey. It is also deeply human and beautifully written. You'll turn the final page with profound regret. And I did. I did. I didn't want it. I didn't want it to end. I wanted some other things to happen, but that's okay. Maybe you'll follow Trace's advice and it'll become a, what do you call that? A franchise? A franchise. Or I could just mail you some of the outtakes also. Oh, good. That would be fun. (laughs) I want to talk about uh, one of the things that that uh, Lahane says, uh, but uh, before we do that, uh, and you t- touched on this a little bit, do you, as a writer living in Los Angeles and working there, do you have LAPD access like Danner? I have I have a really nice network of consultants at this point. You know, you build them up, you get there by mafia introductions, where someone has to kind of vouch for you. To, to make an intro to someone else. So I'm at the point now that pretty much whoever I want to talk to, I can get to, mm-hmm. but sometimes from a, secu- from a circuitous route. Like if I need to talk to someone in the Secret Service, I call a friend who's a Navy SEAL who wants to join out with someone in the CIA who is a roommate with a guy in the service. And then, so there, there's a hookup now that I know enough people who know enough people that I, can, that I can get in around. But I do do a lot of firsthand research out in the field. Okay, okay. One of the things that Lehane says... Uh, he, he talks about the, the book being deeply human. And, and I think the reason for that, or one of the reasons, uh, is, is because the characters are so real. They're, they're, they're flawed, but they're, but they're genuine people whom you would tend to like or at least want, want to know more about. Like this Preston Mills, who's, uh, as I said uh, at, the, at the break, he's a, he is the uh, Danner's editor, He's stationed in New York and hanging in L.A. Right. And uh, he barges in whenever he wants. And uh, the one time that Dana goes over to where he lives, he lives in a pigsty. Yeah. Which is not very editorish, I don't think. Well, it's not. Yeah, it lacks the grandeur that yeah. Preston's managed to cultivate when he's out in the world. He does not like being caught on his own turf. <laughs> is that any editor you know? <laughs> I'm going to plead the fifth. All right. Okay. Another character that that I liked a lot uh, was a character, uh, as far as I can remember, the only name he was given is Junior. Yes. Or Junior, as he pronounces it. Oh, Junior, yes. Yes. And he's a terribly talented juvenile delinquent. (laughs) Yes, he is. He's a juvenile delinquent. And we... I think with, with Hoonier, we keep waiting for him to do something that's redeeming or Disney-like, and every time you feel like you're on the verge of him doing something to prove his Forget worth... It. Yeah, Forget he's, it. Forget <laughs> it. He's completely incorrigible. Oh, uh, dear. And uh, one of the people that is really very, very minor, but I, I think he bespeaks something uh, of probably every law enforcement department in the, in, in the country, a guy who's trying to climb up the rungs... Uh, Cal Unger. Right. And Cal Cal is a consultant who worked with Drew, you know, over the years on his past books. He's LAPD. You know, he got handed off from his boss. He's always played nicely in the sandbox with Drew. But, you know, Drew comes into this now 
tainted. He is he's believed to be a murderer by a lot of people in the community. And so Cal says, you know, the gloves come off and he says, I don't have to deal with you the way that I used to politely anymore. I think you're exploitive. And he really takes him to town. And of course, Drew kind of cuts him down with a line of saying, remember that TV pilot you pitched me once? Because <laughs> everybody in L.A., I mean, I've been on ride alongs with cops in L.A., uh, that halfway through the ride along, the cop turns to me and starts pitching me a screenplay. I mean, there's no. such a bizarre cross between. <laughs> yeah. And the sheriff's department in Los Angeles actually renamed their criminalist division CSI after the show CSI. Oh, no. I mean, so there's this bizarre interplay between Hollywood and crime in Los Angeles. And so, you know, Cal's skating the lip of that in one direction and, you know, Drew's skating well, at the and other. Cal is, is dying to get into RHD. Yes. Robbery, homicide division. Right. And which is what the which is the glamour cases, the, oh, you know, the glamour. Oh, okay. right. And so he's stuck right now in, in, you know, West L.A. station, which they sometimes call West Latte Station because it's, you know, you deal with Beverly Hills and you know, worrying, gets, worrying about what happened to somebody's poodle. Yeah, he got put on. Yes, he got the sign because somebody's poodle ran away. And, you know, so he want he's looking for his big break. And, you know, the last thing he wants to deal with is a, is a crime writer on the skids with a bad reputation now. One of the things that uh, uh, we were talking about before the show was how a, a person who's doing crime writing doesn't have any time or space really to dig deeply into a character. So that when I can say that somebody to me is memorable uh, from a book like, like yours, I, I really mean that as quite an accomplishment. And the, the guy that sticks with me the most is Chick. Really? I love Chick. Chick with his many friends. Yes. Quote, brothers, yes. yeah. unquote. 17 brothers. And he he played ball for the Dodgers and made a terrible error. Yeah. And it's following him around. He's He had his Bill Buckner moment, but he's got, you know, he's so good natured. He's considered, you know, he lost the... The series for L.A. <laughs> and, you know, he's just trying to trying to make good in life now. You know, there's one more character in The Crime Writer that we must talk about. Her name is Carolyn Rains. And and oh, just stay tuned. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster C.O.C. Or send an email to Jim Foster C.O.C. at Gmail dot com. This is Jim Foster. It is Conversations on the Coast, the crime writer. What kind of novel should I say? A mystery? A thriller? I just do crime fiction because it's the safest bet. Okay, but. the crime writer, a crime fiction. Written by Greg Hurwitz, published by Viking. That's what we're talking about today. And uh, a gentleman, another gentleman we've had on this program once. I wish we could get him back again, Lee Child. Outstanding in every way, he says. Hurwitz's previous books, great as they were, look like practice swings before this titanic blast. That's good coming out of my, my other friend who played for the Dodgers. You know, it all links together. It does. Yeah, you're just a home run hitter. That's all there is to it. Uh, I, I, I want to get to Carolyn Raines, but uh, something in the, in the Kirkus Review caught my eye. Hurwitz, they say, carefully... Hurwitz's carefully interwoven plot lines and taut writing, as well as his pulsing descriptions of Los Angeles, make for a deeply satisfying read. And in my opinion, mystery writers, thriller writers are doing some of the best writing done in this country. And I'd like you to share with the folks one of those uh, uh, pulsing descriptions of Los Angeles. Flux is the Hollywood club of the minute, trending hot with wheatgrass martinis, bamboo walls, and a bump and grind DJ beat ideal for ecstasy humpers, film industry underlings, and clubbies. I paid 20 bucks to park in a space fit for a lawnmower and legged it down sunset. Beneath every windshield wiper, a glossy postcard hawking bad theater. At every street corner, a woman stomping her boots against the cold. Even at this hour, bodies spilled from gyms where would-be scribblers and bit players simulated honest work. Bodies so sculpted and chiseled they seem of a different species. Bodies that have endless time to devote to themselves to do that extra six sets of ten on the cable pole that defines the inner prong of the triceps or the outer slab of the quad. I used to have a body like that, a lesser model built from a matching mindset before both grew too weary to keep up. I walked on, taking in the night, 
these bits of a past persona I never quite inhabited. The tangy scent of deodorant, candy-colored iPods strapped to glistening arms, steam lifting from overheated dry-fit shirts like cartoon sizzle. The velvet ropes that in other, more reasonable cities are consigned to museums and musicals sprout from the sidewalk like futuristic shrubs. That's great. That's great. And it, it really at least gives me a sense of L.A. And, and, you know, the energy there and what it's, what it's kind of like, at least in one part of it. I want to get now to Carol, Carolyn Raines, who I, I think is a very memorable character. She, uh, and I think we said once that many of the characters in this book are hurt. She perhaps is hurt the most. Tell us about Carolyn. Well, Caroline, when Drew first meets her, she has terrible scarring on her face. She's got a beautiful face, but she's got really evident marks from what's clearly a knife. And she's got this really tough exterior shell. And one of the things that I was playing with a lot. She's not pretty. She's not pretty. Of face. Well, it would be, but it's horribly scarred. She's scarred. Right. And the scars only align when she smiles or cries is the one time that they sort of align. And then you can see the image of, of what her face used to look like. And so the book, ever since it begins with Drew waking up basically to this nightmare, it sort of deals with the fact that every character in this book is flawed in their own way. Like everyone's sort of busted in their own particular right. beautiful way. Right. right. And she exemplifies that the most externally. With Chick, it's because he dropped the key ball, you know, that lost the that lost the pennant for the Dodgers. With Drew, it's because of the enormous amount of scrutiny and the fact that everybody believes he's a murderer, and he even begins to doubt his own innocence. And with Caroline, it's because, you know, the minute she walks in anywhere, people take in this scarring. And so she's cultivated this real tough exter- exterior to, to interact with the world that's, that's very self-protective. And so her and Drew are up against each other, and they're both sort of trying to knife through this exterior and get to the, get to the humanity underneath. I was just thinking, the, 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 other, the character that has rapport with her is Junior. Oh, yeah. Her, yeah. And, her and Hunier get on great. Yeah, Hunier. Yeah. yeah, it's really, it's really amazing. Uh, this scarred woman, literally scarred woman, and Danner, who's at least mixed up at this point Damaged. in who he is and what he's done, they, they come together in a love relationship that is beautiful and it's mature and it's, and it's passionate all at the same time. Well, I think it's quite amazing. Thank you. And uh, she is, uh, well, we don't want to say at the end whatever because we shouldn't talk about the end. Yeah, we can't talk about we the cannot, end. It's the problem we of We cannot fiction. talk about the end. I, I, but I want to tell you that I find her so real, so honest, you'll carry her away with you when, you, when you've closed the book. Well, thank you. I really That's appreciate it. your giving us. Now, what about the franchise? What about the franchise? Is there going to be one? Uh, you know, future books, it's the one thing I'm superstitious about. I don't like to talk about books when I'm writing them because I'm worried they'll, they'll run away. Okay, so here's an author that won't tell us about his future book. He has spent a wonderful program telling us about his present book. It's called The Crime Writer, and the author is Greg Hurwitz, and it's a crime novel you ought to miss. This has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com.